Education is healthcare. Knowledge is power. This is the Prepper Podcast Radio Network. The new Be Prepare for Christmas package from Sun Ovens contains everything you need to harness the power of the sun for cooking, water, and dehydrating. The perfect gift for the preppers or outdoor enthusiasts on your shopping list. A sun oven uses the sun's power to bake, boil, or steam food, heat water for purification or personal hygiene, or solar dehydrate. When you use the sun's power on sunny days, you preserve your fuel storage for rainy days. Sun-baked foods retain moisture, have less shrinkage, and do not burn. Sun-baked roasts are tastier and more succulent, and sun-baked bread has unparalleled taste and texture. The new Be Prepared for Christmas package lets you roast an 18-pound turkey. For the past 26 years, Sun Ovens has been proudly made in the U.S., are durable, and have a long life and come with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Don't be fooled by cheap imitations. For a discount coupon, visit sunoven.com forward slash podcast. That's sunoven.com forward slash podcast. And with winter comes dangerous driving conditions. Get your vehicle ready for bad weather by getting it serviced as soon as possible. Prepare for emergencies by packing food, water, warm clothes, and weather-appropriate shoes or boots. Don't forget to check the spare to make sure it's usable. Stay informed on bad weather, dangerous driving events by visiting PrepperPodcast.com. When Christmas comes, you don't want your family to stare at an empty chair. Are you sick and tired of having your First Amendment harassed or censored on Facebook? Use no more as we now have a new alternative to Facebook. It's called Awareness Act. Awareness Act is a social network designed for patriots, to be used by patriots, and is ran by patriots. Stand up and help in the fight to protect your constitutional rights. Patriots can create pages, blogs, videos, documents, articles, and so much more. We even have a unique news feed system that allows you to share, read, or connect with any patriot on Awareness Act. We are a dedicated tool for patriots to use against the tyranny our Constitution is facing. So if you're tired of having your rights infringed upon, come check us out at www.awarenessact.com. Again, that is www.awarenessact.com, the social network for patriots, not potatoes. Whether you take me for the fool, I know that I can be. Whether you see me eye to eye. Have you ever wanted to generate your own supply of electrical power, even save money on your electric bill? If so, this is going to be the most important message you will ever hear. Solar power generators are now available. These emergency backup systems provide life-saving electrical power when you need it most. Unlike gas generators, a solar generator runs quietly, emits no fumes, and produces electricity from the sun. It's like having an electric power plant running quietly in your own home. Run sump pumps, shortwave radios, computers, and even keep your food from spoiling. Whether it's hurricanes, ice storms, brownouts, or blackouts, you'll never suffer through painful power outages again. And here's the best news. A remarkable fall truckload sale going on right now that gets you $1,700 in bonuses when you buy a solar generator. To find out why solar generators are the best generators and get $1,700 for doing so, go to falltruckloadsale.com. That's falltruckloadsale.com. Generate your own supply of electricity. Go to falltruckloadsale.com. That's falltruckloadsale.com. This is KPRN-DB, broadcasting worldwide from Southeast Oklahoma, USA, to parts unknown. Coming to you from the foothills of the Sheep Mountain Range and under the watchful eye of Mount Charleston, 11,916 feet above the desert floor, I bring you Homestead Dividends, a podcast rooted in common sense and practical knowledge, where home improvement, homesteading, and self-reliance meet. Hi, I am your host, Dan V, and welcome to episode 155. And before I say anything else, happy Veterans Day. This is being recorded on Veterans Day, or at least observed Veterans Day, uh, the 11th of November 2012, and um, 
I just wanted to say thank you to all of our veterans out there because freedom ain't free. And I know I'm an English teacher and I shouldn't use the word ain't, but I think you can understand my use of a pejorative term here. Uh, freedom ain't free, folks. Uh, people work hard uh, to bring us freedom and uh, allow us to live in the great country that we live in. And so to them, I wanted to just say thank you for your service to our country. God bless you. And I'm actually kind of a military nerd in a way. Ever I see a person out and uh, they are... Um, and they're in uniform, and I know where they have a hat on that says, you know, retired, one of those military hats, you know, that people like to wear. Thank you for your service to our country. I always tell them and interrupt what I'm doing. Thank them in the, you know, shopping malls. I thank them, you know, active duty. They're walking around a grocery store. I still stop and say thank you. And uh, maybe that comes off as a little corny to some people, but uh, I really mean it. Um, I remember as a boy uh, hearing stories about Vietnam. And uh, the soldiers saying they came back and got spit on her were called baby killers and were never appreciated. Nobody ever said thank you. Uh, so I do. In fact, this summer at a Lowe's in western Pennsylvania, one of the guys that always helps us uh, with our uh, fixing up of our house, um, he works in the uh, plumbing section. His name's Art. Guess what? Art was a Vietnam vet. It came up in our conversations because we've gotten quite friendly with the man. He's a very knowledgeable plumber, whatever, and he's kind of semi-retired. He just does the, um, you know, the the Lowe's thing kind of on the side there, just I guess bring a little extra money in here as he's retired. Um, I said, you know, thank you for your service to our country, and he looked at me. He said, you know what? You're the first person that's ever thanked me for my service to our country, ever. I cannot believe that I'm the first person to thank someone who served in the Vietnam freaking war how many years ago? And no one has ever had the, go the doggone common courtesy to thank this gentleman for his service to our country. Um, I was glad to be the first, but sad that I am the first at the same time. Um, so, Art, if you're listening, God bless you. Thank you for your service to our country. And for any of the vets out there who have never heard thank you, I'm telling you to your face, well, I'm telling it to your ears. Thank you. Your service matters. Whether you were stateside or whether you were in the thick of it, you still served our country proudly and uh, you answered our, our, you know, our nation's call. Thank you for your service. And for all of those women who are, oh, well, there are women service people too, but all the wives and girlfriends who stayed behind, faithful and loyal to their spouses or, or loved ones, uh, to the moms who sent their sons off and daughters off, to all of you family members, Thank you for your service to our country, too, because when a person serves, a family serves, too. Okay, well, you can probably hear in the background some car action here. Um, I am mobile podcasting today. Episode 155 is kind of a Veterans Day slash post-election um, show. It's a redo. My first show was strictly and solely on the election, and uh, I recorded it yesterday, and uh, it came across bitter. Uh, and I really didn't have a dog in the fight, and uh, but it just didn't come across right. I am a positive, happy podcaster uh, with a positive, happy message, and excuse me, I just didn't like how the message uh, came out. The reason I'm on the road today is I just got my blood work and my labs done. I have to uh, have some surgery done later this week, and so uh, today being off from work, I hate missing work, so... I got all my labs done today, and I didn't have to take off a day of work, so I'm happy and excited about that. I'll take off enough work with this dog on surgery. So, today, I wanted to talk with you guys first and foremost um, about Veterans Day, because even though that you'll hear this actually a few days after Veterans Day on uh, on this Friday, um, after I'm surgery, after my surgery, when I'm going to be pretty numbed up and goofy, uh, so I probably that wouldn't be a good time for me to give you a podcast. I might say something I regret. <laughs> um, but uh, I still wanted to, you know, just honor, honor our veterans. And to that extent, or to that end, please visit my home site, hdivs.com. Again, hdivs.com. If you go there, you'll notice that yesterday, in honor of veterans, they actually, uh, to actually Saturday, let's put it this way, the previous Saturday, uh, I believe, what is that, the 10th? Um, we were, or the 9th, we were at the uh, Thunderbirds Air Show in Las Vegas. There was a Thunderbird Air Show. And uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, we'd never been to one before. Uh, they put it on, I guess, every year. So uh, you park at uh, the NASCAR parking lot at the Motor Speedway here. They bus you over. You do a little security check, which is no big deal. Um, get on the base. 
and the Thunderbirds birds put on a show for hours. Now, we caught the last, oh, hour or so of it. Uh, we didn't stay till long. It was a really, really cold day. It was in the um, low 50s or high 40s and a really blowing strong wind. And uh, for those of you who never lived in the desert, 40 here is like, uh, you know, 30 uh, when you have some moisture because, because it's so deserty dry that actually... Um, it feels a lot colder because your moisture just gets sucked off your body. You got that kind of little vapor barrier around your body, and it just gets sucked right off. Just like the dry heat is cooler in the summer, uh, dry cold is cooler in the winter too. And um, a lot of people don't realize that, and uh, but uh, but that is absolutely true. And the swimming pool here in the summer is much cooler than a swimming pool back east, where you have that moisture barrier. And I can go into that some other time, but there are a lot of people that can talk about that. So we were over there. We saw the Thunderbirds. I have pictures of AWACS planes. I have pictures of refueling planes. Um, I just shot it with my iPhone. It's amateur video, so it is not impressive. But I just wanted to show you if you've never seen what a Thunderbird air show is like. I know I would have been interested if someone would have gone and said, oh, here's a couple minutes worth of video. Um, I, I probably shot 20, 30 minutes worth of video. I edited it down to about five minutes worth of stuff. Some of it's great. Some of it's not so great. I'm not the world's greatest editor of video. Uh, I do an audio podcast. So, uh, you know, but if you want to check it out, it's on there. You can hear people talking in the background. I don't know how to edit any, any of that stuff out. No big deal. Um, but I did. I edited it to a degree. And, um, you know, it's about five minutes long. It's cool. You can see them do some tricks. But also, I don't have a zoom on an iPhone when it comes to uh, video. You can zoom a camera, but you can't really zoom a video camera. Um, so some of the things seem a little far away, but still, I think, really cool stuff, really fascinating, and definitely worth a look. And I will take all the different clips uh, when I have the time and post them on my website or on my YouTube channel. And if you want to check that out, on the right-hand side of my uh, website, hdivs.com, you can click on YouTube. And you can check out some of my other videos, uh, but the Thunderbird one is right on my uh, on, in a blog in one of the different uh, submissions that I did. So it's right there, like an article. Um, okay, well that take, kind of takes care of Veterans Day. That kind of takes care of uh, you know my Thunderbird experience this weekend, which is really cool. Let me talk about the election. Um, when I was at church the other day, my pastor said that uh, you know this was pretty much a status quo election, or that's how it's being termed. And I hadn't heard that in the news, but I don't disagree with them. Uh, status quo, uh, we kept the same president, we kept the same Congress, and we kept the same Senate. The Senate and the presidency are held by the Democrats. The Republicans, um, they hold the, uh, the Congress. And uh, I thought that that's kind of an interesting way of looking at it, status quo. You know, I think our government's broken, and I don't think necessarily good things are happening right now. So I don't think necessarily status quo is a good thing. Usually the status quo means everything's going fine. Don't mess with it if it ain't broke. Um, it is broke, and I really wish things were fixed, but that's a, you know, another story. Now, my candidate did not win. Uh, my candidate really didn't even run. My candidate was Ron Paul. And then in his place, I voted for the Libertarian candidate. So I did not vote for Mitt Romney. I did not vote for Barack Obama. A couple things. One, I think Barack Obama is a bad sign for our country. He's the president. I think he's a guinea president, and... He's all about entitlements and uh, getting uh, you know, everyone on the dole. And, and I know he's not physically trying to do that, but his policies allow people to continue to become enabled. And we want a country of workers, not takers. And I think that's sad. Two years of unemployment, lots of welfare. Um, the welfare rolls are upwards, heading now towards 50 million. Uh, one in five people is on Medicaid. Um, it's sad. It's very, very sad. And uh, our country is becoming a you know, a welfare state. And I don't think that bodes well for our country, and I don't know if we can go back. This might be the tipping point. This might be the point of no return. Um, but even so, there are many things that we can do as preppers um, that are positive, and I want to talk about that because I don't believe in just complaining. As I said, my previous podcast was too negative. I want to talk about some of the positives that can come out of this election. First of all, the election results are a referendum on prepping. Um, because of the situation and the way that I believe our economy and our society is going, what better time to be a prepper than now? Um, you need to be preparing for hard times ahead because I think they are coming. I see a semi or mild, too moderate, too extreme economic collapse in our future. I see our dollar going lower. I see interest rates eventually going higher. And uh, I see our credit rating taking a plummet. 
So all these things tell me that being prepping, uh, being a prepper is the right thing to do. Uh, a couple things along that line, and I'm just going to take a small tangent here and jump off for a second. Think about what's going on with Sandy. We're almost two weeks out now from uh, Hurricane Sandy, and New York is still a disaster. They're rationing gas, water, clo clean clothing, food, heat, light are all issues. There's still people without light. There's still people without heat. It's snowy. It's cold. It's wet. It's damp. It's depressing. It's miserable. People are angry. People are protesting. Folks, this is New York City. This is the most important city, if you want to look at it that way, and I don't. But, you know, it's the city in the United States, and it isn't back on its feet yet, and people still can't get it together. And that's New York. It supposedly is everything and is the greatest this and the greatest that and, you know, the greatest everything in the world. Just ask a New Yorker. They'll tell you how great it is. But anyway, so, you know, New York, the greatest of everything. And, uh, you know, it's still a nightmare. Okay, this wasn't a nuclear war. This wasn't an EMP. Uh, this wasn't, you know, some ridiculous, paranoid, schizophrenic, you know, uh, tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. This really happened. This is real people, real time, real emergency. So what's that mean? Prepping is real. It, ha it happens. It deals with real situations. And we need to be prepping because it's going to happen to us. A hurricane may not hit Nevada, but you know what? An earthquake might or some other kind of flood, or some kind of fire, or some kind of drought, or whatever it is, some kind of a, you know, disease, a pandemic, um, some, it could be, you know, countries, there are people that, you know, there are wars, civil wars, civil unrest, whatever it is, some emergency is going to face you in your lifetime, even if it's just a blizzard and your lights go out, or an ice storm and your lights go out for a week or three days, all those things can be benefited from prepping, or you can benefit from prepping. Having water, Hot water, hot food, having light, having warmth, having comfort, having safety, all of those things benefit. Gun sales are through the roof right now after the president was reelected. Gee, I wonder why. People are preppers and they're taking matters into their own hands. No, I don't mean forming vigilante posses, but what they're doing is saying, you know what, I need to prepare for the future because I don't know what's going to happen. The president does not like guns, would like to see an assault weapon ban. It was mentioned, and it's been floated several times, the idea of assault weapon bans. Go get them now. If you want to get a weapon, go get them now, because if they become banned, um, you know, they may retroactively come after your guns, or they may just stop selling them, which means the guns that private owners have are going to be worth more. Um, I don't even know if you'll be able to transfer them from one private citizen to another. But um, if so, they're going to be expensive and pricey, and in any case... You know, assault weapons like an SKS or an AK or a, an HK or a AR-15 or whatever, they're all going to be worth more money, aren't they? So, um, if you're going to be thinking about getting one, get one now. Uh, because it ain't going to get any easier to get a firearm in the next four years. So, that would be my first thing. Um, so, I kind of just jumped off for a second talking about the craziness in uh, New York and New Jersey. Just remember, folks, emergencies really happen. That's why we do this. I am not waiting for Red Dawn you know, uh, apocalyptic, uh, you know, craziness. I'm worried about, okay, there's a snowstorm, there's a fire, you know, uh, bad fire, there's electrical outage, okay, there's something happened, there's some kind of a terrorist incident, whatever. My family's safe and prepared. We don't have to be a drain on the system and be fighting in line at the drug stores and at the grocery stores. We have everything we need. We're good to go. And uh, so that's what's important to me is, if you're a good prepper, you're also taking yourself out of the loop of people in needs. You're lowering the demand. Since most people only have maybe three to five days' worth of supplies, if you're not at that store taking supplies out, guess what? You're helping it. You're helping your neighbor indirectly because you're not taking those resources off the shelves. You already have them. And you're paying less for them, too, because occasionally, you know, they'll jack up the prices during an emergency. So you're being a patriotic American by being a prepper. Okay, so some presidential positives. It's a referendum on prepping, as I mentioned, and that can help us to be successful. The next thing I wanted to mention is financial. If you, uh, I do not think the economy is great. I don't think it's going to get great, and I think that uh, the stock market is not going to do well the next four years. This is my opinion. This is not professional advice. Go see your own people. Um, I am not a professional uh, advisor. Um, here's what I think. I think the, I think that the bill is going to come due, and I think that our economy is going to collapse. I think our dollar will continue to go down in value. It has, it has always gone down in value. 
Why wouldn't it continue to do so in these hard economic times? What does that mean? I would be buying gold and silver. If you buy gold and silver or real assets, um, you may be in a position to have a real economic uh, windfall here in the future. And here's what I mean. Let's just say over the next four years, and this is extreme, but I'm just going to make the case. Say you have $100,000 in gold and silver. I don't think they're going to go up astronomically in value. But I think the price of or the value of the currency might astronomically go down in value. Meaning, let's say our dollar buys half as much gold in four years as it does now. That means a $100,000 investment in gold now would buy $200,000, where the gold that you bought now or silver will be worth twice what it, you bought it for now. Okay. If the economy goes bad also, um, that usually means that uh, the housing market um, and big ticket items, the value goes down. So let's say that we go into a recession and a home uh, goes down dramatically in value. Let's give you an example. Uh, let's say a $400,000 home or ranch or whatever farm um, in four years is worth $200,000 because we're in a dire economic collapse and there's everyone's hard up for money or hard assets and there's you know not a lot of money floating around the economy collapses. Okay. Now let's think back to that $100,000 you have in gold and silver. Let's say again that uh, your value of uh, your gold doubles because it doesn't go up really in value but the value of the currency is the value. So let's say your $100,000 worth of gold um, that you bought is now worth $200,000 because the value of the U.S. dollar has got cut in half. Now take that $400,000 form and because of the economic collapse it's only selling for $200,000. Guess what? You now have can buy with $100,000 worth of gold that you bought four years ago a $400,000 farm or house which is now selling for $200,000 and all because you were wise about holding on to hard currency. You see where I'm going with this folks? There are ways to benefit from being a prepper and I think that is an absolutely wonderful way to do it. So by holding on to hard currencies as the dollar collapses or as the economy collapses your real value purchasing power is going to go up relative to everything else. So that is absolutely one thing. Another positive about this economy is I feel that sometimes you have to hit bottom before you can come back up. If the policies that you, if you disagree with this president, and I don't care if you do or you don't. I have Democrats that listen to this, and I, God bless you. Thank you for listening. This isn't a, you know, a partisan show. I don't care. I'm a libertarian. You know, I'm, to, you know, pox on both your houses. You know, Bush. You know, George W. spent a blew, you know, blew out just ridiculous amounts of debt on, uh, you know, the first, you know, the Iraq and Iran wars, and uh, or no, Iraq and Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Excuse me, here I'm thinking about the next war that's coming, um, and Obama added to it. So, you know, I hate both parties <laughs> because they both uh, are irresponsible, spending like drunken sailors on payday. So, you know, to heck with both your houses. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not partisan. But you know, if you're against Obama's policies and you want to see them hit rock bottom. And so we have some kind of a fiscal cliff or, you know, a crisis that we have to deal with and maybe we get serious about it. Maybe that's going to happen. Now, maybe they just kick the can down the road and say, you know, we'll keep putting a Band-Aid on, a, you know, a, a huge, you know, arter arterial laceration and hope then the patient's bleeding to death. But, you know, we'll just ignore it and just put a Band-Aid on it. So maybe that'll happen. But maybe we'll actually, because things get so worse and everyone's with their free handouts at some point, you know, free Obama phones and the free whatever is blocks of cheese and the two years of unemployment give out. Maybe things uh, will actually bottom out and, and people say, you know what, we got to rebuild and we got to do it right. So that I think that can be a positive. Um, a negative could also be that I know that you know Alex Jones. I have a link to it, um, his site. Talks about ten negatives from. Uh, uh, you know the the presidential election. I'm not really going to go into it too deeply. One of the ones, though, that I do agree with him on is uh, he mentions uh, that uh, probably personal freedoms and uh, invasion of you know, privacy will probably be increased. More searching, more TSA kind of uh, you know intrusions on your person and your property. I can see that. I can see the. Um, I can see less privacy. I can see giving up some of our personal freedoms for more um, safety which, you know, I absolutely completely am against, you know, a person, and I don't have the quote memorized, but something, to, Ben Franklin, something to the effect that a person willing to give up, you know, freedom for, you know, safety, you know, deserves neither. Um, and, and, you know, that's a paraphrase. The quote's on my site if you want to check it out, but uh, I don't have it in front of me while I'm driving here, mobile podcasting. I am pa uh, practicing 
uh, safe podcasting here while I'm driving. I'm, I have a clip-on speakers and on my iPod, and I'm not uh, not doing anything otherwise that's uh, risk-taking. Um, so that's that's kind of a negative. I, I do see personal freedoms uh, being uh, undermined. I, I, I do see that. But for the most part, I also think that things aren't really going to change that much. I still have a job, and I'm probably going to have that same job tomorrow. The election's been over a week. I still have my job. You still have your job or your situation. If you don't have a job that hasn't changed or maybe not changed or whatever it is, things probably haven't dramatically changed. And, you know, presidential elections, they, we look at them for the great changes in our society. But, you know, things change on many different levels. And the most important level that it changes on is actually the most local level, and that's in your household. Are you a prepper? Are you doing the right things for your family? You can't save the world, folks. If you, if you pull the lever and you, you, and you vote, you've done your part. Okay, You've made your point known, your opinion known, your views known. But you need to go back to work. You need to go back to the store, or go back to the office, or go back to the school like me, or you know, go back to the work site, job site, building, whatever it is you're doing, uh, the home, and keep doing what you're doing. Because you know what? You're going to have to live your life no matter who's president, and that hasn't changed. And to live the best life that you can, you need to be prepping and storing and preparing and doing all those things that you need to do. That hasn't changed, and it will not change. Yes, I'm not, I'm not thrilled about our president being reelected. I'm just being honest here. I don't think he's a very good president. In fact, I think he's incompetent. But he's our president. I haven't lost my job over the last four years. And I guess I'm lucky that way because many people have thanks to um, his incompetent policies. But that's neither here nor there. Um, I still have my job. I'm still going to work. I'm still prepping. I'm still saving for tomorrow. And I'm still planning on hard times. You know what? If Mitt Romney would have gotten in or my... Um, libertarian candidate would have gotten in, guess what? I'd still be preparing for hard times. Electing Ron Paul wouldn't have saved everything. Um, electing the libertarian from New Mexico that I voted for wouldn't have uh, you know, changed hard times coming down the road. They're still coming. Uh, emergencies still happen. Disasters still happen. Uh, depressions still happen. So, not that much has really changed in your own personal life. But what I want you to do is think about some changes in your personal life. You made an election choice. What do you need to do in your personal life to prepare for the next four years? Make a list of things, goals, outcomes, um, items that you want to have. Build towards long-term goals. Whatever it is, come up with lists and plans for how you're going to attack this next four years and what you need to do to be the best prepared, best prep person and be the best prepper you can be and the best father or wife, husband, mom, whatever. You need to be focusing on all that right now and preparing for these next four years. You know, sometimes failure brings a lot of clarity. And for those of you who are depressed today, and first of all, congratulations to those of you, if you're candidate one, good for you. Um, you know, it brings clarity, though, in, in defeat. Sometimes I hope we learn from our mistakes or our failures. And if we ran this candidate and we considered him a failure, or you consider him a failure, I'm not really Republican, um, learn from it. I'll tell you a couple things. I'm not a Republican, but I'll give you guys some advice today. One, stop uh, nominating liberals from the Northeast. Okay, um, Mitt Romney is essentially a liberal from the Northeast. He didn't win. Democrats nominated Michael Dukakis, a liberal from the Northeast. He didn't win. Um, and especially the Republican Party. Um, why do you even care about New Hampshire? You need to push up the important primaries and have those guys decide who, the, who your nominee is. Okay, Asking a bunch of liberals in New England which liberal... Uh, Republican they want when their state's going to go for the liberal Democrat anyway is irrelevant and stupid. Stop it. Okay? The primary sh should be held early in Ohio, um, Florida, bellwether states that are relevant and important. Let those guys determine who they want to vote for. Um, because you know what? Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Vermont and those New England primaries, who cares what they want? They're irrelevant to the Republican Party. Um, so Republicans, stop going to the, having these ridiculous early primary things and stop letting them pick your people. Second thing is, and this is just me and this probably sounds a little racist or horrible, but you know what? I like someone from the south or the Midwest. I don't like Northeasterners um, for my presidential candidates. I like people with a Texas twang or a little bit of a southern accent. They seem a little bit rooted. They're, I trust them. I don't like these 
northeastern liberals slash Republicans. Um, I like Bubba's. I got to admit it, I do. I like a Republican that likes guns, likes to go hunting, likes pickup trucks, likes dirt under his toes, okay? He's real, okay? Mitt Romney was about as fake as a $3 bill, okay? He was a fabulous little CEO, kind of New York liberal, northeast kind of type guy. I know he's from Boston and originally from Mich Michigan, but you get my point. Kind of that effeminate, you know, executive manicured pretty hair, pretty boy type. I don't like those kind of people. I don't trust them. Okay? I don't like those kind of, you know, well-made, fancy-dressed, you know, executives. I want a guy that knows the NRA and knows how to hunt for ducks and quail and, and you know, owns a Wingmaster or a Remington 870. And, you know, um, you know, he's a regular guy. He has a pickup truck. I drive a Suburban. What do you want? Okay? I'm a regular guy. Okay? Uh, and, you know, I respect those people. So stop... Stop nominating those guys, and I think you'll do much better. If you keep nominating these kind of soft guys, and even soft guys from other places, John McCain was a soft guy. He didn't really, he wasn't really strong. Um, I thank him for his service to our country. He was a great war veteran, but he was kind of a soft, mealy mouth, moderate. Go strong, guys. Go with someone who is strong and has conviction. Someone who's just kind of, oh, well, he's kind of liberal, but he's kind of conservative, and he's kind of this, but he's kind of that. I don't buy that, and I can't vote for someone like that. If you'd have voted for and had nominated someone stronger, um, I would have voted for him. You know, Rick Perry sounded like an idiot after his back issues and, and the meds he was on, but I liked Rick Perry, and I would have voted for Rick Perry over probably even a libertarian. Um, but Romney, he had issues. He was anti-gun and anti-coal plants in Boston and blah, 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 blah. And so and he was changing and pivoting more to the conservative mainstream during the election. And you know what? I just don't trust him, and I, he, I don't think he was a good candidate. But you know what? If you're going to nominate bad candidates, you're going to get bad results, and that's just all there is. And I'm, I'm sorry to those of you out there that thought he was a great guy. I think he is probably a really great stand-up guy. I just don't think he was very strong. He was too liberal. Okay? And my LDS fans out there, there are a lot of really strong conservative LDS candidates. Let's get behind one of those, you know? Or libertarian LDS candidates. I certainly It's nothing to do with his religion, okay, folks? Don't, don't. And I know that for some people it may have been. Not at all. Be out here in Nevada, you know, I have a lot of LDS friends, have a lot of LDS kids. I teach, love them. great people, salt of the earth. Okay, but uh, he was too moderate. You know, I don't even know if they would have, you know, if he was running for governance, you know, in, in Utah, that he would have been elected. He might have been considered too liberal. So, uh, just a thought. All right. Well, anyway, the last thing I wanted to say about uh, a positive from the election I gained, and I think you can look at my comments about the Republican Party com uh, positive. Because I'm telling you ways that you can fix it if you really want to write the ship here. You know, nominate a strong guy. And the last thing I would say along these lines in the election is, would you please make sure that in the future um, that you stay aggressive? Romney lost the debates, the last two debates. He was strong and aggressive in the first one. And he came up soft in the second one, in the third and he became look, trying to look very presidential. But what he came across as is soft and not willing to fight. We liked him because he was a fighter in the first debate, and he went soft, and he got his clock cleaned. And, uh, you know, he got beat up in the second, two, uh, second and third debates, and, uh, you know, it didn't look, uh, he didn't look very strong. And uh, I know what he was trying to do, but it didn't work. Okay, that's my show for today. And um, I'm Dan Vamis. I want to thank you for uh, listening to my podcast. Uh, hopefully I'll be feeling better and bringing out a new podcast soon after uh, after my surgery. And I'm sure you can hear I'm fighting a cold as well. Hopefully they'll still go ahead and fix me here and not reschedule my surgery. That's my show for today. Please make sure you uh, check out my website, hdivs.com. My handle on Twitter, hdivs. And uh, share me with your media of choice. If you like your, my podcasts, go to my website where it says subscribe via iTunes. And... Uh, my webpage or my page on iTunes will pop up. Click subscribe for free, and you're getting all my podcasts now for free. Thanks for listening to my show.